Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. This is your one and only host, Eric Trexler. But today I am joined by a very special temporary guest co-host. His name is Greg Knuckles. Greg, how are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. This is our first episode since our little winter break. Did you enjoy your break? I did. Did you? Uh, absolutely. I did my annual pilgrimage up to the mountains of West Virginia. Sweet. Very underrated state, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, it was awesome, man. I, I hadn't been in zero degree weather in a while, and it's very refreshing <laughs> for a week. Uh, and then you go to warmer places. Good deal. All right. So uh, a couple announcements here to start the show. Uh, we are back from break and we'll be doing a bunch of episodes in the next few months for sure. Um, if you like the show, as always, be sure to like it, rate it and subscribe on whatever platform you use. If you want to help out supporting the show, you can do that by using the discount code SBS pod, S B S P O D at bulk supplements.com. That'll get you a 5% discount off of your order. Uh, you could also subscribe to the Mass Research Review that Greg and I are both co-authors of, along with uh, Dr. Mike Zordos, Dr. Eric Helms. And then, of course, you could also try our diet app called Macro Factor, which does have a free trial, so you can take it for a spin and see if you like it. Uh, now that we're back from break, there are some changes to the podcast format that we wanted to make everyone aware of. Uh, the show will have the same general format, but... The episodes are going to be a little shorter, so they're probably going to be closer to an hour rather than like the typical six hours that we've been pushing lately. And as you're listening to this, just look down at, at the bottom of your little podcasting app and see how close we came to the hour <laughs> mark on this episode. Uh, if, if past is prelude, this one will probably still be two hours or so. But no, 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 no. We'll, we'll see. We'll 90 see. minutes. It'll be 90 minutes. We'll see. But yeah, we're, we're thinking an hour, hour and a half per episode is about half of what we normally do. But lest you feel like you're being uh, deprived of show, the big change is that we're going to be doing shows that are half the length, but twice the frequency. So instead of putting up an episode every other Thursday, we're going to put one up every single Thursday outside of whenever we happen to take breaks. Um, so same general selection of segments, but fewer segments per episode is basically the whole change. So with that in mind, how is the road to the stage going? Road to the stage is going well. Uh, officially back at it. So I uh, took took a little bit over a month off over the holidays. Just, you know, didn't, didn't want to be stressed about trying to lose weight during Thanksgiving time, Christmas time, a lot of good food. Uh, so yeah, took it easy for about a month, month and a half, and I'm back to it. I uh, hit a new low this week at 233, and my trend weight in macro factor is currently at its lowest ever, so 234.8 uh, as of this morning. So yeah, things are uh, things are back on track. All right, good stuff. How is the road to Athens? Uh, so far, so good. Um, people might recall I started out with a great deal of enthusiasm. I was doing a lot of really long runs, but with relatively low frequency. Um, ended up having a little issue with my popliteus, which is, fun fact, the most useless muscle in your lower body. Uh, and if I seem salty, I am. But um, I've been having a lot of success lately with doing shorter but more frequent runs. Um, and I've also had more success running on flat surfaces. So I've been doing a lot of running on pavement. Mm -hmm. I had been doing really long trail runs and uh, from what I understand, that is like the best way to uh, bother your popliteus. So that kind of checks out. Um, but yeah, shorter runs um, on more predictable, flatter surfaces. And I'm feeling good. You know, my, my joints are a lot less beat up. I'm not running into those annoying little muscle strains like the popliteus. And uh, I'm really excited about the fact that, uh, you know, it's now February, which means we're kind of past the hardest winter months like mm -hmm. if you're doing an outdoor exercise activity like i don't want to complain north carolina has very mild winters like it's not like we're putting up with that much but it's a lot easier to run when it's 50 out rather than when it's like 25 mm -hmm. and that's degrees fahrenheit for people um so yeah I, I think you know i'm I'm kind of getting to the point in the year where you have fewer of those runs where it's like frigid out uh, you have longer throughout the day, like you can get out there earlier in the morning, later mm -hmm. in the evening. So 
um, it's just going to get easier and easier from here until we hit like November. So I'm pretty stoked about that. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. What about feats of strength? What do we got? Yeah. So I, I've got four uh, this time around. We've got uh, three training lifts and a competition lift. So starting off with the deadlift, uh, Christoph Weirbicki and Jamal Browner both recently hit uh, absurd training lifts, uh, sumo with straps. Uh, Weirbicki pulled 1,068 pounds or 484 and a half kilos. And uh, Jamal Browner pulled uh, 1,065 pounds or 483 kilos. So those are absurd numbers, obviously. Uh, you know, obviously all standard caveats apply. You know, we'll, we'll see if they can hold on to numbers like that in a meet setting. Um, but though, I mean, regardless of straps in competition, out of competition, whatever, uh, those are the two biggest sumo deadlifts that I'm aware of. So just strong people being strong. And uh, as always, very much hope they can hit it on the platform. Can I share a controversial opinion? I don't know if we've ever discussed this on the show. Go for it. My controversial opinion is that absolutely straps should 100% be allowed in powerlifting. That is my opinion. Why? Because it's just more fun. Like it, it's to me, it's such a shame when someone's deadlift is limited by their grip strength. Like I know that there's a million uh, grip sport athletes who are just pounding their computer screen right now with me saying that. But mm -hmm. I've always been. Well, here's my <laughs> here's what it is. My grip limits my deadlifts and I hate it. That frustrates me. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. I, I can definitely see it either way. Um so w one of the things that I do find kind of interesting is that there there are a lot of people who get very upset when they see someone bench with a really big arch. Uh, you know, they, they say it's they say it's a matter of fairness, you know, like this person, their range of motion is only two inches and this person, it's it's a foot and a half. How is that fair or whatever? Um, you know. You don't see anyone shedding crocodile tears for people who just have really tiny hands and can't hold on to the bar for death. Like, you know, no one looks at someone with huge hands and they're like, that's an unfair advantage. Like, cut their fingers off. Right. Um, which, and so, like, my general perspective on it is, like, who cares? Like, ultimately, with, a, with pretty much any competitive sport, what you're looking for is people with just outlier traits that allow them to do well in whatever sport that is and then they train hard and they're better than everyone else and they uh they're very successful so you know i i see people with small hands much like myself uh who might have grip issues it's just like ah you know what you didn't win the genetic lottery on this one sucks to be you um but just from like a pure fairness perspective like if someone were to try to level the playing field i do think uh in a general sense, straps would make the sport fairer. Um, yeah, I, I, I personally don't care. I wish that there was, uh, I, I wish that there was just like a straps category, you know, yeah. like that, that is one of the things I find a little bit interesting because like, you know, there's, uh, there's divisions where you can wear a bench shirt, squat suit, uh, even among raw, you can go like with knee wraps, without knee wraps. Like, really, the only common piece of lifting equipment, like, used as a training aid that's not allowed in competition in any way, shape, or form is straps. Yeah. So, I, I don't know that I would like straps for just the normal competition, but I, I think it would be cool if there was, like, a straps-only deadlift division. I'll settle for that. That's yeah. fine with me. Um, all right. So, uh, moving on to the bench, uh, Daniel Zamani hit a training lift of 350 kilos or 771 pounds. Uh, I believe the the meat that is planned, kind of the head-to-head -head clash with Daniel Zamani and Julius Maddox is coming up. I don't I don't remember exactly when, but I think it's I think it's within the next month or so. So uh, you know we'll we'll see if one of those two gentlemen is the first to break 800 pounds at that meet I, and i i think that's what they're both aiming for that'll be cool and then finally in the world of equipped lifting i think this one's very cool um so 
we don't talk about every uh, like multiply unlimited equipment uh, all time world record. One just because you know that there's not that many multiply lifters in our audience, less general interest, and two just the the sport has low key fallen off. Like the heyday of multiply lifting was was about a decade ago, but there has been a lot of movement. Uh, specifically in the bench press world record within the past couple of years. Um, it's been it's been changing hands uh, pretty frequently, like I, I think with a greater frequency than it has since like the mid 2000s when uh, Mendelssohn and Gene Rishlock and uh, Ryan Kennelly were kind of trading the record back and forth. Anyway, the, the person who recently uh, rested it from the crowd and now sits atop the mountain is none other than Bill Gillespie, uh, which that might not be a name that rings a bell for most people listening to this. But if you've been in powerlifting for a while, you know who Bill Gillespie is. He's he's one of kind of like the ultimate old school guys in the sport. He's been competing for in excess of 40 years, maybe maybe close to 50 years at this point. Um, but he's 62 years old. And as far as I'm aware, he's never held the bench press all time world record. And, you know, he's, he's just been grinding away and, uh, you know, finally summited the mountaintop at 62 years old and then retired, you know, going out like Jordan, both the first and second time. We don't talk about the third time. Uh, (laughs) but yeah, in, you know, there, there are plenty of very successful power lifters in their fifties or sixties where, you know, every time they do something big, everyone's like, oh, my God, how are they so strong at that age? But, dude, I can't imagine holding 1,100 pounds in my hands, period. And I'm a I'm a healthy young buck. Uh, this guy's 62 years old. And who cares about the equipment? Like ju- just a man that age being able to hold 1,100 pounds in his hands. Absolutely insane. So uh, congrats to him. And it is just awesome to see such a long lifting career be able to end on uh, such an accomplishment. Man, I'm just thinking of the bone density. Oh, of yeah. His forearms. It, it's got to be insane. Oh, man, that's crazy. Yeah. All right. So moving on, I've got a uh, research research review segment on ATP supplementation. Are you familiar with ATP, Greg? I've heard of it. Yeah. So if you open up literally any book, that will make any mention of biology. You will read early in the book that ATP is the energy currency of the body, right? Or the energy currency of the cell. So when we talk about energy in a physiological context, a lot of times we talk about, you know, especially in the nutrition world, we talk about carb and fat and protein and calories and things like that. And that's all good, but ultimately, in order to do stuff in the body that requires energy, we got to break that stuff down into ATP. And that basically is a huge, uh, a huge portion of what we call metabolism. It's just figuring out how do we get from these ingested calories down to ATP to do a bunch of stuff in the body. Um, now, ATP does a lot of things. You know, it's like I said, it's the currency. It's it's the thing that's being exchanged when you're talking about processes that require energy. Um, but ATP is very critical for muscle contractions. And this is why it gets so much attention uh, in the fitness world. So when muscles are contracting, there are a lot of processes that obviously require energy. We need to be pumping calcium all over the place. We need to be pumping sodium and potassium. Uh, We need to be helping the myosin head release itself from actin. Uh, And so ATP is involved in all of these energetic processes of muscle contraction. So the concept, which sounds very nice on paper, is it'd be really great if we could provide some extra ATP for our body via direct oral supplementation. You know, if, if exercise requires so much ATP, and it's so important for muscle contraction, then when we're lifting weights, it seems like it'd be really nice to have some extra ATP around. So this is something that has been studied, um, you know, over the last 15 or 20 years or so uh, on a number of occasions. And so what I want to do in this segment is talk about 
kind of the historical context of ATP supplements and, you know, ATP boosting supplements and, and then kind of tie that into a recent study that came out uh, just this year. Uh, so back in 2004, there was a study by Jordan and colleagues uh, and they were looking at ATP supplementation. They dosed it at 150 milligrams, and also they dosed it at 225 milligrams to see if one or the other or both might be uh, more favorable than a placebo. Uh, they basically found no significant benefits when they were comparing these different, uh, these different groups. So they had nine subjects per group. Um, there were some little within group changes. So like, oh, from before to after supplementation in this group, we saw a significant increase. But at the end of the day, in a placebo controlled, randomized controlled trial like this, what you're trying to identify is relative to placebo, did these different doses of the supplement significantly outperform mm -hmm. that placebo treatment? Yeah. So in this case, um, you know, there were enough of those little within group differences to get people interested. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, a rigorous kind of by the book interpretation of the stats would indicate that there was no significant benefit beyond that of a placebo. And even within some of those little within group changes, you have to be really careful just based on some of the details of the methods. I, I think they did a really nice job with the study, so I, I don't want to sound overly critical, but, um, you know, there were some very obvious outliers. They did a really nice job reporting some of those individual level changes. So like, in one case, I'm, I'm pretty sure single dose supplementation for one person added like over 28 kilograms to their chest press. Um, and that was really just, I would, I would speculate, has something to do with the fact that the chest press increments were not very small. So it was like you'd, you could move up one plate or two or three plates. It was like a machine-based kind of deal. Mm -hmm. That, of course, wouldn't alone explain it. But also just sometimes you come in, you have a crappy day. Or sometimes you're just really unfamiliar with chest pressing, and after a few sessions, it goes up by a tremendous amount, right? Yeah. But rest assured, no one is taking an ATP supplement and saying, you know what? I feel 30 kilograms stronger on my bench right now. Like, yeah. That's not going to happen. So this was a study, you know, it, it served its purpose as kind of the first study that I'm aware of in this area that kind of set the stage for future studies to kind of build upon. Um, but... Herda and colleagues came in uh, 2008 with a purported ATP boosting supplement. And once again, um, supplementation did not lead to any really exciting differences between groups. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention in the Jordan study from 2004, probably one of the most important things from that study. Good thing I glossed over it. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering if... Uh... <laughs> If there was going to be some sort of like big twist reveal at the end, no. Let, let's yeah. get let's get all the cards on the table. So, the supplement in the Jordan study, whether it was given at 150 milligrams of ATP or 225, it did not increase blood ATP levels. Um, and it was really great that they checked in that study. But obviously, that's something that really sets the stage for major limitations in future research, where you're like, well, if an ATP supplement is not increasing circulating ATP levels, at least based on, you know, plasma or, or serum measurements, what might be going on here yeah. if a supplement did work, yeah. right? So Jordan in 2004, no real significant benefits. Herda in 2008, no real significant benefits. Um, and then there was a study by Lowry and colleagues, actually a, a series of studies by Lowry and colleagues, all coming out of Jacob Wilson's lab down at uh, the University of Tampa. This was a series of studies where they looked at different combinations of ATP and HMB supplementation, sometimes both of them together. Um, and this series of studies, I'm just kind of going to hit the highlights of it. Like, I'm not going to go in, in, into really deep depth about the various methodological details because this series of studies uh, received very considerable interest from the scientific community. Um, you know, it, it received at least one letter to the editor, this group of studies um, that raised some questions uh, about the results and and things that appeared to be inconsistencies from study to study. Um, and one of the things that really got a lot of attention um, and, and various blog posts and articles covered this, the reported effects from different combinations of ATP and HMB were very comparable in magnitude to just straight up using steroids. Because um, there are studies on 
using steroids and lifting weights, uh, controlled studies. And so, um, there was a lot of back and forth about that at face, you know, on the surface, it seemed quite implausible that ATP and HMB would have this kind of effect because both had been studied previously and had never done that type of thing. And then you dig deeper and it seems even more implausible. Yeah. yeah. Th- and, you know, I know, I remember one of the things that came up, I saw a lot of people say, well, no, it's just that there was this really hard training program and that's why it did this thing. But like the placebo group also did the training program yeah. and had very, you know, fairly typical placebo group type gains. And so that would kind of necessarily imply that like the training details don't even really matter unless you're throwing the good stuff in there with yeah. the HMB and the ATP. Like, so yeah, there was just a lot of stuff that came up that seemed relatively implausible. A lot of scientists, um, you know, kind of echoed that, that, um, skepticism about these studies there were letters to the editor and and so that's kind of uh where i leave it with that particular series of studies but uh there's been another kind of wave of atp studies coming out so uh defritas and colleagues in 2019 uh, they had subjects taking oral atp supplements at a dose of 400 milligrams and uh, they ended up completing significantly greater volume load across four sets of half squats. And this was, you know, in comparison to a placebo treatment. So in that study, it looked like, okay, for some reason, uh, and again, the mechanisms really aren't very clear. It appeared that ATP given at 400 milligrams was helping people complete greater volume load in their training. So maybe this would be a nice training aid that helps you complete more volume per session, per training block, and, and potentially would, uh, facilitate better longitudinal adaptations to training. And that is a leap going from acute effects on training volume to longitudinal effects on training adaptations. But that would be the thought process there. So Helms actually reviewed that study in mass. And he did a really nice job summarizing all of this ATP literature up to that point. And Helms, you know, came into it with an open mind and basically concluded based on the evidence, you know, maybe ATP supplementation could possibly enhance performance, but if it did, it appeared at that point specifically that it would help in circumstances where you're doing, you know, multiple sets taken to failure or multiple sets with short rest periods. It's about kind of attenuating some of that fatigue in higher volume sessions where fatigue is really ramping up between sets. Uh, however, that, that was his kind of, um, you know, that, that was his like, maybe there could be something in these scenarios. But he also uh, concluded that based on the inconsistent findings in the literature uh, and the uncertainty related to the actual mechanism by which ATP supplementation would work, uh, he advised readers to hold off on ATP supplementation until more conclusive research became available. So um, he's like, maybe it could kind of work in some of these scenarios, but we don't know why. And the research seems to be really inconsistent. So probably not a safe bet with ATP supplements. Uh, Now, there was a new study by Dos Santos, Nunez, De Mora, and colleagues in 2021. I actually reviewed it as a research brief uh, in the mass research review that went up today, February 1st. Nice. So this study had 20 recreationally trained male participants It was a crossover design, so each participant completed all four of the study conditions. And the the conditions were either a placebo, 100 milligrams of ATP, 200 milligrams of ATP, or 400 milligrams of ATP. And in all cases, they were ingested 30 minutes prior to uh, exercise testing. So they were doing four sets of barbell half squats, uh, squatting to about 90 degree knee angle. And they were using a load of 80% of one rep max, two uh, two minutes of rest between sets. So in terms of the findings, uh, the 400 milligram ATP dose uh, appeared to significantly increase the number of reps completed in set one. Okay. But um, this was not, there there were no significant effects with the lower doses. uh, And also none of the ATP doses led to significantly greater uh, total reps or total volume when you look across all four sets. So what's really important about that is that, you know, Dr. Helms, 
the good Dr. Eric Helms tentatively said, okay, maybe ATP could do something, but based on the literature, it should have its biggest impact potentially if you're doing multiple set performance theoretically to failure. It should be in the later sets mm -hmm. when it's uh, attenuating this fatigue that we really see ATP shining as a supplement. In this case, it only appeared to matter in the first set, which kind of goes against that, um, that rationale. And also, I, I think you would have to question the utility of a supplement. You know, if, if you were to take a supplement and you're doing a, you know, 16 set workout, and it's like, this will help you do more reps on set number one, <laughs> but, but not two through 16 and not total, you know, it's not going to favorably impact your total training volume in the session. I would very strongly question the utility of that type of supplement if that's representative of the true effects, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so yet again, we find ourselves in a situation with ATP supplementation where when we look at the applied research and we say, okay, what is a dose that should work and in what circumstances should it do some predictable thing related to physiology, we still have uh, a lot of ambiguity and a lot of inconsistency. So every time a study like this comes out, uh, some people who are more uh, supplement friendly are very quick to pick it up and say, hey, looks like ATP actually works now. Let's go ahead and supplement with it. I'm still quite skeptical um, for two main reasons. First, of course, is the inconsistency related to the applied findings. But the second one that we really can't overlook is that I really struggled to identify a mechanism that seems both plausible and optimally targeted by ATP supplementation. Mm -hmm. So the, the two most common mechanisms you'll see there, the first one is just very generally increasing ATP availability during exercise. Like, hey, exercise requires ATP. Here's some more ATP. The second mechanism you hear about a lot is potentially ATP supplements increasing blood flow via vasodilation. So the idea is that red blood cells kind of take up this ATP, and that's why we're not seeing it increase in like plasma mm -hmm. after oral supplementation. And then during exercise, those red blood cells are, are kind of letting go of that ATP and, and helping promote vasodilation during exercise. So the first issue is with the ATP availability one. So like I was reading through a textbook and this is really, these numbers are really baffling, but based on the, the textbook I was reading, I didn't bother to go in and recalculate stuff. So uh, <laughs> the human body based on the textbook uses 40 kilograms of ATP per day at rest. That's crazy. I did, I did not realize it was that much. Yeah. So again, I didn't bother to go through and recalculate, but somebody let this into a textbook and I don't know, seems fine for me, but 40 kilograms of ATP per day at rest. And during intense exercise, uh, the, the textbook indicated that ATP utilization can reach up to 0 0.5 kilograms per minute when you're doing like really intense continuous exercise. Mm -hmm. So if we take those numbers at face value and assume that they're even within the ballpark of being close to true, the idea that you're going to introduce 400 more milligrams, yeah. so like 0 0.4 grams of ATP into exercise and actually do anything with it, you know, anything beyond just a drop in a bucket, it's just really implausible to think. Yeah, just to make the uh, just to make the math easier, if we say it's 500 milligrams, yeah, that would be enough to cover one one thousandth of your ATP needs per minute during intense <laughs> exercise. Right. And, and which, so, which doesn't seem like much. Yeah. And, and so if you're hearing that, you're saying, well, okay, but that's for 400 or 500 milligrams. Let's really ramp it up. The, the human the body. The dose lift the most, baby. Exactly. Yeah. So the human body can only store about 80 to 100 grams of ATP at a time. That's one of the reasons that it's so important for us to be continuously generating it is because we can't just have like a 40 kilogram flap where we keep all of our ATP that we're going to need for the day. So, um, yeah, so like we need to constantly be creating it, throwing 400 milligrams into the sea of ATP. It, it's a drop in the bucket. It, it's really not going to matter. So then the other, um, 
the other issue is through the whole uh, idea that the red blood cells are taking it up and, and eventually they're helping to promote blood flow via vasodilation and things like that. Um, so during exercise, red blood cells do release a little bit of ATP. This is part of what promotes localized vasodilation. There's really a lot of stuff going on during exercise that manages vasodilation and vasoconstriction during exercise, especially locally. There are many, many things happening to make sure that the muscle is getting sufficient blood flow to do the exercise it needs to do. Also, a lot of control going on to make sure that blood is circulating appropriately so that we don't have insane fluctuations in blood pressure and, and, and you know, uh, cardiac output and things like that. So this is a finely tuned response. Um, now, there are conditions where you might see that uh, ATP release from red blood cells is reduced. And so this could potentially attenuate vasodilation during conditions of exercise or conditions of hypoxia. So it is possible that attenuating ATP release from red blood cells could be problematic in maximally facilitating this vasodilation. However, this is generally seen in older sedentary people in experimental conditions. So we don't usually see this kind of impaired ATP release from red blood cells in young, healthy people. We also see that this impairment that kind of occurs with age is attenuated very considerably in older athletes. So the idea that we're seeing these huge effects of ATP supplementation in young, healthy, active people, I think it's relatively implausible based on this particular mechanism and everything that comes with it. So I'm just not there yet with ATP supplements. I don't think the applied research is consistent enough for me personally. Um, I don't think the mechanisms are very clearly elucidated. We know that plasma kind of circulating ATP is not increasing to a noticeable degree mm -hmm. when, when it's provided as a supplement. Uh, perhaps red blood cells are taking it up for, for later use, but I'm just not seeing a clear mechanism that would explain uh, some of the applied findings that have been observed. Doesn't mean that ATP could not possibly do anything. It's just the research really isn't there yet to give you a really strong basis for what it's doing and how it's doing it. So one of my things that I want to focus on moving forward is not just uh, shooting down ideas, but also trying to make sure I'm giving good alternatives and being maximally helpful. So let's say that you found some of those mechanisms to be interesting. ATP availability and vasodilation. One of the reasons that I really see ATP supplementation as a non-starter is because we already have really good supplements for both of those things. So if you're really interested in maximizing ATP availability during exercise, I can think of no greater supplement than creatine monohydrate. Oh, I thought you were going to say EPO. Uh, well, <laughs> supplement, <laughs> uh, supplement. So, uh, Creatine monohydrate, like, you know, we, we talked about the amount of ATP that you need relative to the dose provided. It just doesn't make any sense. Physiologically, mm -hmm. it's, it's a drop in the bucket. When we supplement with creatine monohydrate, we can increase our total creatine concentration in muscle by, you know, up to 15 to 30 percent if we're a responder to creatine. And we can increase phosphocreatine resynthesis by up to 20 to 50 percent. These are real big physiologically relevant changes in the phosphagen energy system that provides ATP during intense exercise. So if you're really intrigued and thinking, oh, I'd like to use a supplement that increases ATP availability during exercise, go with creatine. It's tried and true. There's a million studies on it. If you want more vasodilation, this is something we've talked about a million times before, uh, four to six grams of citrulline and or 400 to 800 milligrams of dietary nitrate. It's an extremely straightforward mechanism by which these supplements would facilitate vasodilation if there's any impairment of vasodilation occurring. So you look at some of the studies in younger, healthy individuals, and sometimes you don't see a big effect on vasodilation with these supplements. Um, it, in some cases, it still improves performance without meaningfully affecting vasodilation through other mechanisms. But when you look in situations where vasodilation might be impaired, particularly studies with older individuals who are sedentary, 
these supplements do a really nice job with, with promoting vasodilation. So it's not just that the ATP research is inconsistent. It's that it looks like it's filling a potential role here that is already taken care of by supplements with much more research supporting them. So mm -hmm. Uh, for those reasons, I'm still very skeptical of ATP supplements, and that's not to disparage any of the individuals doing research in this area. I'm just really skeptical by nature. So I, I need a lot of evidence to convince me to open up my wallet or to convince me to recommend a supplement. I haven't seen it yet with ATP, and it's going to take not just you know one more study showing a few more bench press reps. I need someone to really show me how it's working and somehow convince me to believe that it's doing these things better than the supplements that are already available. You know, mm -hmm. so for me to go with ATP over creatine and a more established vasodilator, I'm just not even close. Yeah. And, and just to spell things out more with the, with the creatine comparison, one of the reasons that creatine would be a preferable supplement to something like ATP, even if ATP worked, is... You know, let's say you take some ATP, it increases muscle concentration of ATP uh, one time, you do a set, you kind of deplete that, and then you're just back on the, the normal ATP resynthesis treadmill. Um, whereas with creatine, what, what creatine itself does is like it's this little thing that phos phosphates can latch onto, and then as you deplete ATP during exercise, it's a lot quicker to just kind of take a phosphate from creatine phosphate and move it over to an ADP to make it an ATP again. Uh, so that, that's a very quick and efficient little, little swap you can do. And then that creatine is still hanging out in the muscle. So, uh, you know, you finish a set, you rest, take some time, breathe, kind of get back towards energetic baseline, and you can attach more phosphates to that creatine that is still in your muscles. So basically with ATP, it would just be kind of a one-time use thing, whereas higher creatine concentrations in your muscles could improve performance, you know, every single set over time. Yeah, and that, that's a really good addition because it contextualizes one of the numbers that I shared. Some of the earliest studies on creatine were looking at, you know, in responders, how much are we actually facilitating that process, that mm -hmm that resynthesis of phosphocreatine where the creatine during rest periods is taking up all of those phosphates so that it can then very quickly, you know, contribute to more ATP production. And in responders, we're talking about a 20 to 50% increase in the rate of that phosphocreatine resynthesis. So it is a noteworthy, physiologically meaningful impact there. So with ATP supplementation, like I said, um, it's fascinating. I, I like the physiology behind it. I think ATP, if you like physiology, you have to think ATP is interesting because like that, like I said, there, that's what metabolism is. You're spending most of your time talking about ATP. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm just not really there yet with, with ATP supplements. And I think there are better options on the market. Uh, hopefully we'll learn more about ATP in the future. But uh, for now, I, I'd personally say skip it. Yeah, I mean, my... Uh... My slightly less charitable read of the literature. So I actually, actually, I, I've got a question for you. Okay. The 2019 and 2021 studies on ATP supplementation. Uh, do you remember right off the top of your head if they were industry funded or not? Uh, I know the 2021 paper was industry yeah. funded. I don't know the 2019 paper off the top of my head. So the like j just looking at those results. The first thing that comes to mind for me uh, is that I know that uh, one of one of the companies that sells an ATP supplement is pretty active in in funding research. And just looking at some of the differences, especially in that 2021 study that were there, like, you know, you you have four sets, you only find a significant difference in one of them. Uh, the difference, like the raw difference is 1.2 reps and the P value is 0.04. And, you know, there's four other opportunities to find significant differences, the other three sets and then overall volume. And they didn't find that, you know, but they still found one significant difference. Paper gets published. To me, that smells a lot like the, the tactic of just like industry funding studies and then just kind of picking and choosing 
which experiments they want to get published or not. Um, you know, so it, it makes me wonder if there are also a lot of recent null results that are just kind of sitting around unpublished somewhere. Um, and, and, and to be clear, like that's, that's not taking shots at the researchers themselves. Like that's a, that's a relatively common, uh, approach for, for industry funding to take. But yeah, ju just looking at those results, it, it, it looks like what I would expect if that strategy were being employed by industry. Yeah. I mean, you know, my, my thing is I, I don't have, I know you're not doing this, but I, I don't try to, you know, get into the intentions of what might be going on behind the scenes or anything like that. Um, I'm just, you know, looking at the data, I, I, I'm, I would assume that there are probably some acute studies on ATP supplementation that are just sitting in a, yeah. a file cabinet that, that didn't get published um, of the stuff that has been published. One of the reasons I don't I haven't dug too deeply into the behind the scenes kind of considerations is there's not even enough out here in the open to even say like, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. You should definitely be, t you know, if there well, were yeah, like, I, I mean, we might know 10 years down the line, a meta analysis gets published and there's just the wonkiest looking funnel plot you've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, you know, there, there's for, not even enough now to, to get an idea of that. Yeah. And also just not enough to, um, not enough to make me so like for example if there was a study that or a, a supplement that hit the market and there's like nine studies even six studies showing considerable meaningful benefits and it's consistent there's a, a mechanism identified uh you know the effects look the way you would expect if that mecha mechanism was working consistently you know, if if that were the case, but all the studies were coming from this one group with this one funding source who owns the supplement, then you start to say, wait a minute, there's a lot of positive data out here, but I'm getting a little uneasy about it. In this case, there's not even really enough positive data to, to bother digging into the deep stuff, because if someone's saying like, hey, I really want to take it, I'm like, I, I don't really know why. Like, there, I, I just don't see enough positive data out in the open to even bother worrying about what's going on behind the scenes, you know? Yeah, that's fair. Uh, next segment. Yeah. All right. So I, I got two back to back. Uh, one is a SBS article discussion segment, <coughs> which is going to be very short. Um, basically just letting you know, there's a new article on the website by Cam Gill, uh, looking at Rose. So, you know, Rose, very popular exercise. I don't think we've ever written about it, uh, about Rose on Stronger by Science before. Um, I don't know why, just never got around to it. So uh, Cam hit me up, uh, and, and just for longtime listeners or readers, um, if you read the Reverse Nordic Curl uh, article on Stronger by Science from, from a few months ago, uh, same author. So yeah, it's a it's a really good article um, talking about how uh, different planes of movement, different grip widths, uh, different amounts of wrist pronation, supination, how all of those variables um, might affect which muscles are predominantly targeted by different row variations. So you know, if you're setting up a training program and you're like, hey, I want to I want to train my back, want to get big, uh, and I specifically want to target. Uh, trap development. What sort of rows should I do to grow my traps? Uh, I, I think that article will be um, a, a very helpful resource for uh, selecting the style of rows that is most in line with your training goals. So uh, that article is on strongerbyscience.com. And if you have not read it yet, check it out. Absolutely. I think uh, Cameron did a great job with that. I agree. Good stuff. All right, moving on. I have a, a little coach's corner segment rare um, for you you don't do a lot of coaches corners i don't i don't uh i should because it's it's the easiest stuff to put on an ally <laughs> um, but yeah so i i wanted to um i wanted to expand a little bit on uh s some of the information you covered in your big goal setting section both from your article and uh, from a recent episode of the podcast. And one of the things that I got a fair number of questions about, uh, especially after the article came out, is 
like people asking, like, you know, I, I understand like part of the goal hierarchy idea that, that you were talking about people saying, like, I understand parts of this stuff, like the, uh, the underlying process goals that underpin kind of the intermediate goals and how you can have process goals that support, uh, multiple outcome goals and all of that. Uh, but there was a bit of confusion about what actual practical utility a superordinate goal had. So if, if you remember, uh, if you remember that podcast episode or that article, basically, if you're setting up a goal hierarchy, you have superordinate goals at the top, which are kind of uh, like an underlying value, like the, the thing that your outcome goals are supporting. So you know, let's say you want to improve your diet, you want to start exercising more regularly, things like that. Uh, your superordinate goal might be related to either getting healthier or maintaining good health. Um, so that's kind of like the overarching thing that everything else kind of flows from. So um, yeah, I, I got some questions about like, just what is the practical utility of having a superordinate goal? And I think one of the I think one of the big things it does for you um, is I see a lot of people just, you know, across the internet in the Stronger by Science groups and Reddit and Facebook and whatnot, um, who will ask questions along the lines of like, you know, hey, like, I don't know why, but like, I've been pursuing these goals and I, I just have no motivation right now. What's going on? And oftentimes you kind of, you kind of interrogate that and you realize that maybe they just got it in their head. Like, Hey, like trying to get as strong as possible is a good thing to do for its own sake. So like, I'm, I'm just going to do that. And maybe their training is going well, but like, they're just having a hard time staying motivated to keep going to the gym consistently. And then you kind of interrogate it a little bit and you're just like, well, you know, why do you want to squat 500 pounds? Like what, what is underpinning that? And oftentimes it's a question they haven't really even considered before. Um, and then, you know, they think about it a little bit more and they're like, you know, ultimately I decided I wanted to start lifting in the first place. Cause like, you know, got into my thirties, used to be active when I was younger, found myself out of shape. And I said, ah, you know, I'll, I'll go to the gym. Uh, and then, I met up with some power lifters and they said, oh, yeah, like this is fun. You should try powerlifting, getting strong. Very cool. Uh, so I tried it. And then like, you know, now I see looking back a couple years later, uh, I got into powerlifting and, you know, I, I fell for the idea that cardio kills your gains. And so, you know, maybe my overall activity levels have gone down even, <laughs> even as I started training, uh, decided I wanted to be as good as po at powerlifting as possible. So uh, moved up a couple weight classes when, you know, maybe that wouldn't have been, uh, the best thing to do for body composition and general health. And then you look back on it and it's like, well, you know, ultimately like the superordinate goal, uh, if they would have framed it that way, it's still kind of the same. Like, you know, they're still somewhere in their late thirties and maybe they have a young family and they're like, you know, I, I want to be healthy. Like that's, that's the main thing I'm interested in. And the initial steps they took were, towards that superordinate goal and then at some point uh you know it, it kind of got diverted and they kept setting outcome goals that were within the same general genre as when they first went to the gym you know have, have some sort of quantifiable thing to progress on but over time their like intermediate outcome goals drifted pretty far away from what the ultimate thing they cared about was and the ultimate thing they wanted to accomplish and to be clear like, I, I'm not just taking shots at powerlifting here. Um, you know, the, the, I see the same thing happen with, like, physique athletes all the time. Like, hey, I went to the gym because I wanted to get healthy. And now, like, I'm 6% body fat and my hair is falling out and my dick doesn't work. Like, that's, you know, maybe not uh, the most compatible thing with optimal health. So, you know, I, I see stuff like that happen pretty frequently where people start losing motivation and just never, like maybe never really interrogated in the first place why they wanted to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. Um, or, you know, maybe they did, but they they hadn't really checked up on it in years. 
And so I think one of the benefits of having a clear superordinate goal is it helps you make sure that the actual actions you're taking and the like intermediate quantifiable goals you're pursuing are still uh, in service of that thing you you ultimately care about. And I think a lot of times when people do end up losing motivation, it's because the actions they're taking and the intermediate quantifiable goals they're pursuing um, are are can become pretty badly misaligned with the superordinate goal that they care about. Uh, that it, that if they would have been more explicit about like what's driving these outcome goals, maybe they wouldn't have drifted so far away from it in the first place. And I, I think that can help that can help people maintain motivation. Like if if your actions and your kind of underlying drives and motivations are are better aligned. Um, so that, that's just general advice for people, but it's also general advice for like trainers and coaches because I I know that that happens all the time too. Like you know, let's say a client comes to you and they say like, you know, I, I just want to, I want to move better. I want to have more energy and you're a trainer. And so first place your brain goes is like, well, okay, let's, let's kind of set some quantifiable goals like that, that we want to pursue when training this person. So they say they want to move better. They want to have more energy. And so you operationalize that. It's like, you know, uh, if we can get this person to be able to like, say, do a full squat, uh, and like do deep lunges that they can tr- that they can control pretty well relative to most of the population that that uh, qualifies as as moving better and certainly for a lot of especially middle aged clients relative to their starting point that would be like clear quantifiable evidence that they are moving better uh, and they want to get in better shape so you say like you know let's let's do some uh, like let's try to get them in better aerobic shape. And since it's kind of a personal training setup, generally your time with them isn't very long. And so you're not going to make them pay for a session where it's like, well, well, you're going to run on the treadmill for an hour and I'm going to watch you. Uh, So, you know, you you have them do some interval training in the sessions that you have with them. And so, you know, early on, those things that you're doing, like just getting them moving, doing some intervals, that's, that's very much in line with helping them get more energy and working on their mobility and their movement patterns, getting them to be able to squat and lunge well, that's very much in line with their goal of moving better. But then as time progresses, I think I think it's pretty easy to kind of lose sight of what those underlying motivations were in the first place. So, you know, they uh, get to the point where they can do a deep squat and do it well. They get to a point where they can do lunges with body weight and control it well. So the first place your brain goes as a trainer is like, well, you know, now we're at the point of progressive overload. Like they can do the exercises we wanted them to do. So now let's now let's load them up a little bit. Same thing with the interval training. They start getting in better shape, and it's like, well, you know, let's uh, shorten the rest intervals or push the intervals a little bit harder or raise the intensity on them. You know, whatever. Just basic progressive overload. And so you know, maybe the first three months you're working with this client. Uh, everything you're doing is very, very much in line with what their goals are and what they're trying to accomplish. But then you get maybe another six months down the line and you're training them as, as if they're like a sprint cyclist, uh, you know, trying to make like an Olympic team or something. And, you know, like they, they've made a lot of quantifiable progress, but maybe after you kind of cleared that three month mark, maybe it's not necessarily in line with, what they actually wanted to accomplish. And, th- and that's something I see from trainers a lot. It's like, oh man, like my, my clients were making progress, but like they, uh, they stopped working with me. Like their, their motivation seems to be waning, but like they're getting so much stronger or like they're losing so much weight. What's, what's wrong? And it's like, well, like, is, is that actually what they wanted? And, and like, sometimes it is and like clients just suck, <laughs> but oftentimes I, I think it is a matter of just like, a trainer kind of losing sight of what matters to the client and, you know, just over time, the the goals you have set for them and the things that you're trying to pursue with their training program maybe drifts away from the underlying things that actually matter to the client. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's one of the, I think that's, that's maybe the biggest uh, practical benefit of having a clear superordinate goal. Um, that, you know, you don't just mention once and then never really think about again, but that is actually 
like pretty close to top of mind a lot of times, especially as you maybe meet a goal and you're setting a new one. Just check back in. Like, d- d- is this superordinate goal still my superordinate goal? Like, maybe have my underlying drives and motivation shifted over time? If so, that's great. Uh, if they haven't, and it's still basically the same, are these new, like, quantifiable outcome focus goals I'm setting actually in line with this underlying thing that does ultimately matter to me the most. And as long as you keep that in mind, uh, I I think it becomes a lot easier to maintain motivation with the goals you set for yourself and to take actions that allow you to follow through. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought this up because this is something I talk about with my clients a lot in Mm -hmm. coaching. Um, Sometimes I'll have clients Fortunately, not too frequently because, you know, in ideal scenarios, clients are loving their training, motivation's high, everything's good. But every Mm -hmm. now and then I will have this conversation with a client where, you know, they'll kind of mention that motivation has been really low. And, you know, it's kind of it's not just like I had a tough week. It's it's been weeks of low motivation. They'll bring that information to me. And I kind of feel like I get the sense that they're expecting some tough love. Yeah. Like, like I'm supposed to say, well, you got to want it bad or, yeah. or something like that. <laughs> you got to you got to tough through it. And that's never been my approach. And even before I dug into this literature about superordinate goals and things like that. But it's always seemed really intuitive to me that if you are sensing low motivation for a sustained period of time, you don't really have a motivation problem. You don't really have a willpower problem. You have a misalignment problem, like you mentioned, like. The issue there is, in my opinion, oh, we have a dog that entered the room. The issue, in my opinion, is that uh, what's happening is, like you mentioned, there's some drift going on. And our program now is not currently facilitating the pursuit of a goal that is still super important to that individual. And so we need to realign those things. So my first thing is not to do the whole tough love thing and say, hey, you got to pick it up and just do it. I encourage people take some time to think about, you know, what are we doing this for? Well, you know, do we need to reassess what some of our intermediate goals are? Do we need to reassess what our superordinate goal is? And I think finding that alignment usually sorts out a lot of the motivation related issues. Mm -hmm. And another thing I try to get my clients away from when they're feeling that that kind of like low motivation, everything that we're doing is just kind of grinding and toiling Uh, There are some short term scenarios where you do have to grind out some tough training blocks. Um, But in many cases, I I think a lot of times people, they kind of create this dichotomy of like instant gratification versus delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. And some people adopt so much focus on delayed gratification that they don't enjoy a damn minute of their training career Mm -hmm. because they're always like, oh, no. In 20 years, when I'm way stronger, like this will all be worth it. And so what I try to get people to embrace is the idea of continuous gratification, where, Mm -hmm. of course, we're leading towards some kind of goal that's important to us. But like if we are not enjoying that process and feeling great about taking the steps toward it, I I, I just think there's a huge missed opportunity to really love what you're doing there. So, yeah, it seemed like you you disagree with me. No, I I don't disagree with you. I, I think. This is this is a one of my spicier takes. I think the whole concept of delayed gratification is actually complete bullshit. Um, so you agree with me more than I thought? Yeah, yeah. No, wow. I, I I don't think anyone does it. Uh, yeah, I think that. I think that largely, I, I think everyone is kind of doing the continuous gratification thing, and I think that a lot of people who swear up and down that they're doing delayed gratification were just like taught and acculturated into a particular mindset that gives them a little dopamine rush when they do do something that is typically associated with delayed gratification yeah such that they're actually getting their gratification yeah in the short term like you know the the classic example that people always come back to is like you know saving your money instead of like spending it every time your paycheck hits and like I used to think that with that, I was doing delayed gratification, but dude, my, my parents just like drilled that into my head from day one. Um, cause like they didn't come from, uh, a, a, uh, particularly well off financial background. And so like 
for for me and my brother, they just drilled into us from a very early age, like spending all of your money is bad, saving money is good. And so like, you know, when I when I would save, I used to be like, oh, I'm I'm doing this good, virtuous thing, like I'm delaying gratification. And then and then I thought about it, I'm like, no, it stresses me out to spend money and I like saving money. Like yeah. uh <laughs> I don't know. Like I'm, I'm doing the thing that in the short term makes me feel good because it was like so drilled into me at an early age that like, no, it, like if you spend this money, that's bad. So I don't know. I, I think that that's, um, I think that that's like a mindset that my parents instilled in me. That's, that's helpful in a lot of ways, but there, there's no delayed gratification going on. Like yeah. <laughs> spending that money would stress me the fuck out. Like it, that, that would not be short term gratification. Um, so yeah, like, I, I don't know. I'm sure that there's a little bit of that that goes on, but I, I think that a lot of behaviors that people associate with, with delaying gratification, I think a lot of it is, is motivated by just like underlying cultural values that they were taught and kind of like a sense of duty and whatnot. And so that like, when you do those things, it makes you, it makes you feel good because you think like, oh, I'm, I'm doing the good thing right now. So yeah, I, I think everyone's doing the continuous gratification thing. I, I think that's a a complete, a completely bullshit and unhelpful false dichotomy. Yeah. Well, in either case, you know, if you are noticing that you are really dragging your feet through training, um, whether it's because you're you're locked into this concept of delayed gratification or because you just haven't spent a lot of time pondering about what your superordinate goal truly is. Um, if you find yourself in a position where your training just feels like a chore and like a second job that you dread going to, something is off. You, you should address that. And the recipe to success there is not more willpower and generating false motivation because you know, it probably ain't going to work. Yeah, definitely not in the long term. All right. So moving on to the Q&A's, as predicted, we are way behind on time. I'm going to go very quickly. You know, we could just go back to the old schedule of normal episode q a episode if we're yeah. at, if we're in an hour already we could just do q a next week yeah i'll do one q a um but then next week we'll do a whole q a episode cool does that sound good yeah that works cool um all right so very quickly i got a question um i think this was from reddit the question was does the glycemic index matter um with macro factor a lot of our users you know there, there, there's in any nutrition space always questions about carbs versus fat. And then even further into that conversation, you know, how do we choose our carb sources, good ones versus bad ones and so on. So one of the things that comes up a lot is the glycemic index. Um, and I cannot think of an index or a metric that has been misused more than this in the nutrition world. Um, and, and I'll talk about the little instance where there might be a little bit of utility, but you know, a lot of times we get this question about the glycemic index coming from people who are, you know, generally healthy, fit, exercising, um, you know, they're consuming mixed meals with all different sorts of foods in it. And they're like, should I, should I be swapping out my carb sources for a lower glycemic index value carb source? So before we get into the applied stuff, the glycemic index, basically what you're looking at is the area under the curve. They look at the blood glucose response. They, you, you are in a fasted state, usually a 12 hour fast. They give you that food alone. So not a meal with that food, just that food, usually 50 net grams of carbohydrate worth of that food. Uh, you eat that. They look at blood glucose over two hours. If you have a huge blood glucose spike, usually that means it was a really fast digesting carbohydrate. Blood glucose goes really high in that initial period. And the, the glycemic index value is high and they're all standardized usually against glucose, which would have a value of 100. Um, so, so it's this quantification of relative to a standard, in many cases, glucose, how much does this particular food spike your blood sugar in isolation in a fasted state? So that seems like a pretty good idea. Um, initially, it came out to help people with diabetes manage their acute blood sugar excursions in response to a meal. Um, and especially before they had, you know, I think nowadays, a lot of the insulin pumps, if you have a pump are like automated so they can kind of sense your blood glucose and then deliver the appropriate insulin dose. But, um, I'll admit I've never, I mean, I, I don't have diabetes and I've no one in my family's ever had diabetes, but my understanding is that there's some degree of 
calculation going on before a meal in terms of like, okay, based on this meal, I might need to have this much insulin. Mm -hmm. Is that fairly accurate? I don't know. But <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that, that seems very plausible to me. That's my understanding of why the glycemic index came out was basically, hey, we need to help people with diabetes, make some informed decisions about not just their food choices, but also, you know, how are they going to manage insulin, insulin injections and things like that. So uh, apologize if you're in clinical nutrition and I'm just completely stomping all over that. But the shortcomings of the glycemic index are numerous, especially in the context of healthy folks who are exercising a lot. So first of all, the glycemic index is measured with a set number of net carbs, like I said, usually 50 grams. Um, but that ignores differences in the energy density of a food, right? So like uh, watermelon is kind of the classic example. Uh, they're like, here's 50 net carbs worth of watermelon, which is like, so you just eat seven kilos of watermelon. Yeah. It's like a tremendous amount of watermelon. And, and so then it has this yeah. uh, high glycemic index value, but it's very different from saying like, here is a serving of white bread and here is a serving of watermelon. Yeah. Like they're going to have different net carb values. So that's one of the issues there. Um, it standardizes net carbohydrate, which completely ignores the context of serving size. Uh, another thing is that the glycemic index, like I mentioned, usually measured in an overnight fast um, with a single food consumed in isolation. Most of the meals we eat, other than breakfast, are not in an overnight fasted state. So we're still digesting food from a previous meal. And then the foods that we eat are usually consumed, our carb sources are consumed along with usually a protein source, a fat source in various combinations. And when you start adding, uh, you know, fat and protein and different amounts of fiber into this mixed meal, it drastically can alter the dynamics of that glycemic response. So all of a sudden, this number that used to be very relevant is now getting distorted by interactions with other foods in the meal. And also, I mean, the glycemic index value of a food can change as a fruit ripens. Mm -hmm. It can change based on the way you prepare a carb source, the way that you cook it and the yeah. degree to which you cook it. And it also just doesn't tell you about the quality of the food, right? So um, when you're looking at a carbohydrate source, you might, be, you might be thinking about the vitamin and mineral content. You might be thinking about the fiber content, the energy density, the, the way your, your GI system tolerates that food if you're, if you're a little bit sensitive to it, the palatability of the food, the convenience of the food when it comes to cooking and storing. Um, if you get into coaching, convenience of food sources is so important, you know, like you can have the best diet plan in the world put together, but if it's like, yeah, I don't know how to cook that and I can't store that and bring it to work, the whole thing is, is useless. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the cost of a food is important as well. So the glycemic index doesn't really tell you anything about those things. And in my opinion, those are some of the most important things to consider when you're evaluating a carbohydrate source. So, um, you know, th they have come out like after the glycemic index, they came out with the glycemic load, which I'm pretty sure, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the whole idea with the glycemic load was to account for that issue with standardizing the net carb content. I, I think glycemic load takes into account the kind of standard serving size in addition to like, you know, the, the glycemic response. So the gly glycemic load is a little bit of a step up from the glycemic index, but it doesn't come anywhere close to solving all the other problems associated with the metric. So, uh, when I'm dealing with someone who is not diabetic, who is generally healthy, exercising, things like that, and they ask about glycemic index, my response is it's just really not worth worrying about. Um, the uh, in all my years of coaching, you know, I, I don't do diabetes management, which is why I know so little about it. I'm actually proud to not know about it because I shouldn't. <laughs> like, yeah, if I'm getting in there like pretending to be the armchair diabetes counselor, like. No, that's not what I'm here for. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, I don't do diabetes management. It's a critically important thing. It's just not my expertise. And I leave it to the people who are good at it. So yeah. my caveat is if you're working with a medical practitioner, they, you know, and they know your medical situation way better than I do. And they're telling you to be mindful of these different metrics with your carb choices. Of course, if you're under medical supervision, working with a practitioner, take their advice. But I can tell you that outside the context of diabetes, where I do my work, I have never once considered or advised someone to put a lot of thought into the glycemic index. It is a very, very limited metric that has very limited utility outside of, of those uh, clinical applications. 
Yeah, makes sense to me. Cool. All right. So normally with the show, we try to keep the vibes pretty good um, to play us out. Um, unfortunately, we are bidding farewell to, to two individuals, very influential people uh, who have had a huge impact on the world, who unfortunately passed away within the last few weeks here when we were on break. So uh, I'm going to go first here. Um, a while ago on the show, I had the Road to Enlightenment segment where I talked about how I was doing a lot of reading about uh, Buddhism. And, you know, I started out reading a lot of stuff by Karma Yeshi Rabge, who uh, is really fantastic. But uh, after I read through all of his books, I started reading a lot of, a lot of books by Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a, a Vietnamese Zen master. Um, his impact on the world was incredible. Um, you know, he was uh, really outspoken about the Vietnam War. And in fact, Martin Luther King Jr. nominated him for Nobel Peace Prize for his uh, peace activism surrounding the Vietnam War. Um, I was reading a, a lot of articles since his death uh, a, a little over a week ago. Uh, apparently, a lot of people who did a lot of really important clinical breakthroughs in terms of kind of weaving clinical psychology and mindfulness practice leaned heavily on some of his earlier books um, and, and credit him for kind of facilitating the formation of some uh, clinical psychology techniques that are still used today as treatments. Uh, so Thich Nhat Hanh uh, had a huge impact on the world. He is a, a tremendous writer. I've been reading his books nonstop for the last like probably four or five months. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, it was really sad to hear of his passing uh, a little over a week ago. Um, I really love his books, uh, How to Fight, How to Relax, No Mud, No Lotus. Um, those are three of my favorites. But uh, if you have any interest in topics that fall under mindfulness uh, and, and Buddhism or secular Buddhism, I would highly encourage you to, to check out his books. Um, like I said, it was really sad to get that news that he had passed, but he passed at the age of 95, lived a remarkable life, um, and had a huge, huge impact. Uh and my, my in memoriam is for Bud Jeffries, uh, passed away recently. And um, it, that one hit me hard because there was no, it, it, it was very out of the blue. Like there was no indication that he was in poor health. Um, like it, it was just kind of a, a random thing. Uh, and he was, he was easily one of my biggest inspirations uh, early in my strength sports career. Uh, if you've, we've talked about Bud on the podcast before, but if you've never checked out his stuff, you should, uh, go to his Instagram account. Uh, go, I think his old YouTube channel is still up. Check that out. Um, I would say that he was both strong and just overall physically capable, uh, just in a insane variety of ways. Like if, uh, if you followed Bud on Instagram and one of his his posts showed up in your feed, you'd have no idea what he was about to do. Um, you know, he might be lifting up the back end of a tractor trailer truck or he might be like holding a 200 pound rock overhead in one hand and like shooting pistol targets with the other hand, like just just all sorts of stuff. Um, and I, I I found that very inspirational early in my lifting career. Um you know, just because like I didn't want to kind of feel like I was just locked in to like, oh, I, I do one strength sport and that's it. Um, and uh, he, he was also just just a very nice guy. So I, I've talked about this on the podcast before as well. But uh, like er, early in my lifting career, I was a very um, like very excitable and very, very invested teenager. And so I used to just send messages and emails to the people I looked up to, just like asking them for advice and whatnot. Uh, and even back then, like when I was very much a nobody, Bud was one of the very, very small handful of people who would actually like return my emails and uh, send very helpful advice. Very, very nice guy. Uh, I, I've never heard anyone say a bad thing about him. And, uh, so yeah, he, he was a, he was simultaneously a big and very underrated part of the strength community. And, uh, he will definitely be missed. You know, after hearing that he passed away, it really it caught me by surprise. Um, I, I went and 
obviously when someone has that big of an impact, there's going to be articles, there's going to be a lot of uh, outpouring of support on social media posts and things like that. And I, I did a lot of reading in those articles and those posts. And the thing that really jumped out to me was uh, someone had mentioned uh, kind of an anecdote. They, they mentioned that, you know, Bud's, uh, his feats of strength were always a spectacle, right? Mm -hmm. Like one of the most recent ones I saw was he picked up a huge boulder and then shot a bow and arrow while holding the boulder. And so with those kind of unconventional feats of strength, you're always going to get people online who come in and make comments about how oh, just squat, bench and deadlift like that stuff is silly. Mm -hmm. And of course, with way more toxicity behind it than that. And someone was sharing an anecdote that they were that person. Mm -hmm. he, you know, there was a video they came on and were just being mean to him and, and something like that. And he responded with so much kindness. Mm -hmm. And they were just saying like, one interaction with bud changed the way that i interact on the internet mm -hmm. you know and that's that's just such an incredible legacy to leave or to leave so um yeah bud really strong guy but really kind guy i've never interacted with him once but to see those kinds of stories of him changing a person's perspective about how to treat people is i mean that that's really incredible yeah, yeah. all right so i think that does it for this episode um as always, we appreciate you listening. We will be back once again uh, with the new schedule. We'll be back in one week. Uh, so take care, and we'll talk to you soon.